Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed your lunch. And uh, uh, please take your seats. We're just about to begin with this session on uh, countering foreign information manipulation and interference in Europe, uh, which will last until 3 o'clock. Uh, before we get to that, though, I would also ask uh, all of you to please register uh, again uh, in the session-specific registration forms that some of my colleagues will pass around at this moment. If you could just pass it on to the next person and uh, sign it, that would be immensely helpful. Thank you. Um, but without uh, further ado, uh, welcome to this session on, uh, like I said, countering FEMI in uh, Europe. Um, my name is Goran Yurgiev. I work as a senior analyst for the Center for the Study of Democracy. Um, and uh, our objective in the next hour and a half is uh, twofold. One is to present the diverse set of challenges facing the European Union and the rest of the uh, continent related to uh, authoritarian information operations, media capture, and cognitive capture, both from within and from without. And, uh, and secondly, to explore the various solutions and measures recommended by uh, scholars, policy analysts, and the private sector. Um, and to this, to this end, here, uh, here with me today are our, our esteemed panelists. Um, the ultimate goal, of course, is to uh, build bridges and common understanding across different sectors of society. And I'm happy to say that we have a diverse set of panelists, starting with uh, Marius Dragomir, who is the director and founder of the uh, Media and Journalism Research Center, uh, Przemysław Żurawski Wałgrajewski, who currently serves as the Security, Defense, and Foreign Policy Coordinator at the Chancellery of the President of Poland, Andrzej Kuraru, who is a co-founder and security policy expert at Watchdog MD, based in Moldova. Bianca Toma, uh, who is a project manager at the Romanian Center for European Policies, or CRPE. Uh, Amori Lesplingart, who is a co-founder and CTO of Czech First, a software and methodologies company based in Finland. And last, but certainly not least, my fellow colleague and analyst from the Center for the Study of Democracy, Maria Stujanova. Um, as we are on a very tight schedule, I will kindly ask our panelists to please keep to the limit of uh, 15 minutes. It is entirely possible that I might interrupt you if we start going over that limit, but uh, uh, I'm sure we won't have to. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Marius Dragomir. Marius, please. Okay, uh, I have a presentation. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and uh, the introduction is great to be here to present some of the research work that we have done at the center. Apologies to those who have seen that. This is uh, some, a series of academic research that we have run for some time. Uh, we are in a, in a, a session looking at uh, uh, how to build resilience, um, and the focus of our work is on media and journalism. And what I'm going to talk today is about um, the four models of uh, new psychologies that uh, we see emerging in Europe. Um, and how we have done that uh, when it comes to, to methodology, we have studied for years ownership structures in the media. We have studied uh, the audience um, uh, of, of media outlets, uh, but also a very important entry point, and this is what we have used in our work, is funding. If you really look at the sources of funding in the media, uh, you understand a lot, and if you look at how they travel in a media market, you uh, kind of understand a lot of the health <coughs> 
of that uh, information system and of the journalism uh, system. Uh, when it comes to media, you have, and this is historically uh, true, uh, we have uh, four key sources of funding that we have analyzed, state funding in the, forms of, um, in the form of government subsidies, state advertising, tax incentives. We have commercial uh, funds, but mostly advertising. We have what we call audience wallets, and this is when people in the old days paid for a copy of the newspaper, these, day, these days uh, subscriptions, um, and a source of funding very important for, for, especially for this region, philanthropic or donor funding. There is another one that I would touch on, which is informal payments, uh, the forms of uh, financial corruption that we see in, in various countries, and again, that's very, um, that's very relevant for, for our region too. So basically what we have done, we, we map these sorts of funding, uh, we take them all, we put them, as a student of mine was saying, in an air fryer, and then let's see what is coming out. And what is coming out are, um, this is work in progress, so um, it's, we are still analyzing countries and maybe more will come, but we have identified uh, four um, new psychologies uh, or journalism ecologies across Europe. And starting with the, the first one, we call it for now the platformized corporate model. This is a model where uh, specific for some Western European countries like France, uh, Spain, Germany, Ireland, where the main source of funding is commercial advertising and in recent years in some countries also tax subsidies. Uh, you, might have, uh, you might be familiar with uh, the bargaining codes in some places, um, also audience wallets, and in some places you also find philanthropic funding, especially foundations that want to reach a certain audience. The type of ownership in these models is um, business, business oriented. Um, the, what is very specific for these countries is that it is, they are characterized by the conglomerate type and they have a medium to high concentration. The good news in these places is that uh, you have relative independence of journalism but also because of various factors and because many of these companies, especially in the publishing area, are, are owned by families or, or companies with interest in other, in other fields, you kind of sense, a sen uh, sense some, some sort of regimentation, uh, some sort of you know, editorial control in, in various levels, but still editorial independence uh, is, uh, is important for this model. Um, moving uh, to the next model, and this is basically, I think, where we all aim to, to, uh, to, to go. What we call the public interest model, uh, unfortunately, is, uh, is a rare you know, phenomenon just present in some Nordic countries. Uh, this is a model um, <clears throat> that is um, characterized by new forms of taxation. This is um, the, that, uh, that are meant as protection mechanisms for a public service media sector. And on the other hand, a very strong advertising market. So if you look at that, is, you know, especially if you come from the journalism field, this is the perfect world, you know, and it exists. It still exists in some countries. Unfortunately, in some of these places, public service media come also under, under attack, so there are some issues that we notice there. It's a, in terms of ownership, it's a business-oriented um, uh, model with medium to high concentration, but also a very strong sense of the market, and, uh, and I can speak more about that. Um, in, in terms of journalism, these are the places, Finland, Norway, Denmark, uh, Sweden, where we find independent public interest oriented um, um, journalism and a very healthy, as I mentioned, balance between commercial and public funding. The third topic, and this is in fact why I wanted to, to, to give you like the, the broader perspective is because in recent years I spoke and wrote a lot about the capture model and at some point everybody thought that we have capture everywhere in Europe. Um, we have a capture model that has emerged especially in, in the, the, this region um, and in countries like in Eastern, Eastern Southeastern European countries like Hungary is the textbook case but we saw it in Serbia, uh, in Bulgaria if, if, you, if, you, if I'm wrong let me know, uh, Turkey, this is a model, first of all, just to, to, to make it very clear and to visualize it. Uh, capture, uh, and this has been tested through research, capture appears when four elements, elements appear. One is the control of regulation by the government. The second is when the government achieves control of public service media. The third is a use of funding, public funding to control the media in the form of state advertising and other uh, forms of funding. And the fourth is takeover of private businesses. So basically, again, if you work in the media, if you think about these four areas, regulation, public media, public funding, private ownership, you basically control most of the market. So back to this model, what is specific about that is that state funding is dominant, um, and we have identified what we call the tunnel-funnel system. This is a very 
uh, I would say funny if it's not tragic, uh, model where basically, you know, if you are in power, if you have the political power, you can build a media empire with taxpayers' money. And you see it in Hungary, and you see it in most of the countries that have that. And how you do it, you basically take money from the public budget, you tunnel it to the private companies, they don't have to be media companies, and then those companies, usually owned by oligarchs, they buy media outlets on your behalf and they turn them into propaganda outlets. So at the end of the day, and that means that you funnel the money. So at the end of the day, you are in power, you use the taxpayers' money, and you build the media you want as, as we see that. In terms of ownership, this is a model, uh, again, with state-controlled levels, high levels of financial corruption, obviously, um, high levels of concentration, and also in some countries, this model is developed through family uh, relations. If you look at Turkey, a lot of the owners in the media are you know, uh, people in the family of the, the, uh, the, the President Erdogan. You have f forms of nepotism. Um, and it's at the end of the day, what you have in these countries is a very uh, small place for independent journalism, and on the other hand, uh, a propaganda, highly instrumentalized journalism uh, system. And finally, and this is a model that we have noticed recently, uh, we thought that with Capture we ended it all, but we have what we call the atomized model. And atomized, because it is a very fragmented model with lots of media outlets, and when you look at that, you have the impression, someone would say, this is great, you have a lot of competition there, a lot of diversity, but when you actually look into the ownership structures of this media, it's not like that. It's, it's in fact a model that um, is characterized by a very high, even higher level of instrumentalization. We find it in many Western Balkan countries, in Romania, Bulgaria sometimes, I think a student of mine added sometimes here. Um, and what is very important here is that this is a model where you have state funding, commercial revenues, widespread informal payments. This is basically when you, you pay journalists to, you know, to write about you, to give you coverage, or you pay media outlets. And of course, these informal pay payments, they are called informal because they are not tracked in any form. Um, and of course, this is a model that is a, a specific target for philanthropic and donor funding. When it comes to ownership, we see here trends like mercenary journalism. Journalists just you know, get uh, taking money to, to cover the topics that people who pay them want to cover. In some places, it's called journalism for sale. It's a model that is characterized by fragmentation. You have uh, literally hundreds and thousands of media outlets and obviously private interest-driven model. When it comes to journalism, obviously it is a highly instrumentalized system where media outlets do not report the facts, but actually they hire journalists to attack each other. Um, in, in Romania, a friend of mine who's a scholar told me that it leads to a phenomenon that is called destruction of the journalistic language because these journalists actually, they do not know anymore how to express themselves in journalistic language. They are hired to attack other media outlets or the, the, the owners or the rivals of your, uh, owner of, uh, of your media outlet's owner. Um, the type of operation is obviously wealth-led, weaponized journalism with a high state interventionism uh, level. And it's, of course, I'm sure you might wonder, you know, what is worse, you know, capture or atomized? The, the answer is hard to say, but in both places, I think we deal with a, with a, with a great, um, uh, a great uh, uh, problem in terms of the independence of the media outlets. Now, this is how Europe looks according to our work, or our four models of news ecologies. You have the, the green part, which is the corporate model, the public interest model there in the north, and then you have eastern and some parts some countries in southern Europe uh, sharing the captured and atomized model. The gray, the gray ones are countries that we haven't, um, we haven't uh, collected the data yet, and again, work in progress. But, um, but what does this tell us, actually? Um, so, well, you have both negative and positive implications for the health of the, the information sphere that we have. First of all, we have a widening gap between news media ecologies. As you see here, the, I think the colors of the, on the map tell you the whole story, uh, with a loss of what we call journalistic referentiality. Uh, it's a word that is very hard to pronounce. It word this day, uh, today. Uh, and that means basically that if you look at the, the field, in many of these places, you don't have you know, the, the, the journalism as the, the lighting in the system, the, the source of reference for people looking for information, which is an issue that I guess you have been dealing with and covering and speaking about a lot today, uh, at, uh, today and tomorrow at this conference. 
Secondly, you see a, a growing a dominant propaganda narrative across Europe with the government controlling the media on the rise and the emergence of new forms of propaganda and disinformation. And again, you, you, there is a lot of literature about disinformation, but when you look at the journalism and the media systems in many countries in Europe, the source of disinformation are exactly the governments that are uh, in place to actually adopt, uh, adopt policies that should fight disinformation. I spoke a lot about the instrumentalization of journalism specific for this um, uh, that, that is coming with that where journalism is wealth and politics driven. Um, there is also, um, when you look at everything happening in journalism across Europe, a problem with the audience disconnect. I'm sure you, you have followed the, the increasing number of studies about the news fatigue, the news avoidance, and I think a lot of that is related to, to these trends. Um, and of course, this is a big issue. Uh, we, I don't have time to, to cover it in my presentation, but we shouldn't forget about the tech pressure, the influence of, of the large tech platforms on, on journalism, which, which should be um, also studied to really understand what is happening. When it comes to positive implications for the, the health of the infosphere, um, there is, uh, you know, when you have these systems that are uh, highly uh, instrumentalized, that are uh, heavily controlled, that are um, uh, with, with a high level of media ownership concentration, you have spaces where you can build actually resilience. And the work we have done more in the field shows that there are new forms and formats of communications that appear especially at the localized level. At local level, media outlets are appearing. Of course, there is not a perfect situation. They do not have the, the perfect financial sustainable model, but they are appearing and they build new forms of, of journalism, very often community-led. Also when we look, because as I said, this, um, this work um, is done based on collecting of financial data. Uh, when you look at the data, in fact, there is a certain, in fact, large financial value for journalism in some countries. If you look at a company like The Guardian, last year they had over 230 million pounds in revenues. This, this is 230 million pounds in revenues. This can actually, I think, fund the journalism ecosystem in Bulgaria, maybe, or or North Macedonia. If you look at a, a, a company like um, Media, who is in Belgium, again, a turnover last year of over 320 million euros and a profit of 50 million euros, and, and so on. I just picked up some, some data here to actually show that there is still value, financial value in journalism. Of course, there are many caveats there. There are many issues. In, in, in fact, some of these companies are losing money, not all of them. Um, companies like Agora in Poland, for example, which publishes uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, also has a very healthy, very hefty revenues, but on the other hand, you have to look that they have developed a very complex system. They own many other company, many other um, companies in many other industries, including, um, including outdoor advertising and so on. And finally, independent news media, there are increasingly resilient niches in, in spite of this gloomy picture. We see, um, for as I mentioned, a lot of, uh, at, or at least some models of financial sustainability in countries like Slovakia, Romania, um, uh, Czech Republic, and also we shouldn't forget the powerful investigative journalism networks that we have across Europe, which I, I guess you know. Uh, addressing the independent journalism problem, I will leave it here because um, uh, this is, um, I, I think, something for us to think about. I'm very happy to take questions, but um, when it comes to solutions, I guess we come back to that. So leave it here to give time to my wonderful uh, colleagues to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Marius. Uh, there's a reason why your analysis and uh, methodologies of media capture have been so influential. Uh, our own methodology has been very much influenced by it. Uh, but next, I would like to welcome uh, Przemysław uh, Zurovsky. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure and the privilege to address you as um, a Pole, a man from a country that is probably the most experienced in the world as far as fighting Russia, because we fought 18 wars since 1492. So we are very experienced. And this is why we know that this story hasn't started 
in 2014, neither in 2022, and that the problem is much more complicated. I would like to structure my unfortunately short presentation, 15 minutes, it's not enough, uh, in the following way. First, short description of the enemy, of the problem. Then the goals, what Russia wants to achieve. Then the methods and the modus operandi that is uh, used by Kremlin uh, to achieve that goals. And what are the conclusions? So first, please remember that Russia, the only idea of Russia that exists is the imperial one. There was no other idea of Russian state. It's not created to bring welfare for its population, neither to uh, make the life uh, better uh, or to develop the country. It's to expand. And the main goal of its leaders is to maintain a power. Even imperial goal is not the real one. Please remember that Russian Empire was dissolved twice, once in 1918 in Brest-Litovsk, and second in 1991 in Białowieża forests, for the sake of sizing power at Kremlin. That's the main motor, the main engine uh, of Russian politics. So Russia is able to sacrifice its own population. Russian people, from the point of view of the Kremlin leaders, are just the fertilizer of the history. That's it. Then, fighting all those wars with Russia, we remember that one of the main characteristics of Russian propaganda is that whoever is fighting war against Russia is doing it against its own interests. It must have been manipulated. This is why it's resisting. We were fighting wars in 16th century because of Pope and Jesuits. In 1794, because of French Jacobins. Then we were the servants of Napoleon. Then we were manipulated by Garibaldi and Napoleon III. Then we were the dog of Antant fighting Bolsheviks. And then we were manipulated by Great Britain. This is why we resisted both the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. And now we are the servants of CIA. It's obvious. Yeah. Nobody is resisting Russia because of its own interests. So we are quite vaccinated for this kind of propaganda. I mean, you cannot tell this to the Poles and hope being successful. Uh, still, Russian methods are based on a very well-organized targeting of the victims in propaganda dimension. I mean, the message is shaped in accordance to the address, to the people who are addressed uh, by that message. I am very grateful uh, to uh, our German colleague who had an excellent presentation in the first panel that uh, helps me a lot to uh, present you the reality of that operation. You cannot go to the polls and say, where well, Russia is uh, the last defender of the Christian values, because it sounds like a cabaret text. You have the uh, colonel of KGB, everyday work was to defend uh, Christian values. Come on. You know, it's a very good joke. Uh, but uh, you can say the things that serve to Russian uh, goals, political goals, via other institutions, via Germany, via European Union. And what is the main goal is, as has been already told here, it's to portray the future victim of the aggression as somebody that is not worth being assisted, to isolate the victim, to portray it as, as a bad guy, you know, whether it is Estonia spelling as Estonia, you know, to, to uh, stress the uh, Nazi uh, formation during the Second World War. Either Ukraine as being portrayed as this uh, Banderland and so on. Uh, either uh, Russophobic Poland or Russophobic Balts. Uh, it's very useful to portray it as, for example, anti-European. 
Now, if, because what we want as Poles, we want a strong American military presence in the eastern flank. So we are bad Europeans. Yeah? We are American donkey in Europe, Tryon donkey, yeah? serving to the Americans. No, because we know that what Russia really is respect is military power. And this is why we have to arm ourselves, which we are doing at the high cost of our taxpayers, but to deter the enemy effectively, you have to build up the credible, not for us, but for the enemy, the credible system of deterrence. And uh, look at the situation in Western Berlin during the Cold War. It was a difference whether there is only Western Berlin police or whether there are Americans, British and French troops on the spot. Not due to the pure military reasons, because that garrison could be smashed in a few hours. But because it was American, British, and French, Russians never took a decision to try. And this is why we need Americans in the Eastern Front, potential front line. Still, my presentation was entitled between the Russian Imperial uh, Hribris and the skill of uh, European post-national uh, narrative. Look, as I have said, in pure military terms, we need strong American military presence. And the idea of European um, strategical autonomy uh, is, fits very well to the Russian goals, and because there is no real military potential in Europe. There are a lot of talks, but uh, please believe me, I, uh, this is my main field of uh, researchers since 1994, uh, and uh, nothing is on the spot. You know, we have 3,000 troops in a good uh, semester, and one and a half thousand in a bad one. Uh, without American satellites, they are blind. Uh, and without American uh, logistic, they can do nothing. Uh, and the decision-making process is another funny story. Uh, have you ever heard about the Turviren summit in 2003, which is uh, called uh, the uh, Pralinka summit, because the main outcome was to, uh, the fact that they consumed some Belgian chocolates. Uh, no real decisions were made. Uh, and we are still uh, debating about that yeah, since uh, 1991, uh, but there are no uh, real military uh, instruments. And of course, uh, everybody was uh, offended when Trump said, pay 2% of GDP for armaments uh, if you want to have a real defense, and then declare, no, we will not, but we will do it ourselves without American paying less. Come on, be serious. Yeah? Either you pay the money and have the uh, capacities, either you just ha have a lip service. So that's the problem. And now some uh, facts to illustrate the nature of the challenge, because we are, in fact, in between. In 2021, there was a huge operation launched by uh, Russian and uh, Belarusian Lukashenko services the artificial immigration crisis on Polish uh, Belarusian border, as well as Lithuanian and Latvian Belarusian borders. And we are under the pressure of the European Union uh, not to stop the uh, immigrants. We were accused of violation of human rights. Uh, there were the accusations of uh, massive graves in Polish forests at the borders without any real fact. Uh, to support this kind of uh, accusations. Uh, when uh, we arrested uh, Pablo Gonzalez, who was uh, an alleged Spanish uh, journalist, uh, just a few uh, months ago uh, exchanged uh, with Russia, and in fact uh, his real name was uh, Pavel Raptev, and he was a Russian spy. Uh, you can read in the uh, report of the European Parliament uh, that Poland is violating human rights by arresting this innocent journalist. Uh, what I am trying to say is 
uh, that uh, our countries are under the pressure from both sides. Uh, for different reasons, of course. And I don't want to create the impression that these are something comparable. I mean, if Russia is a black death of 13th century, uh, the diseases in the European Union is just running nose. Yeah, but when you are, uh, when you have this small disease, you are more vulnerable for uh, the serious one. Uh, and uh, it was uh, France and Germany that tried to invite Putin to the European Union summit in uh, June 2021. And uh, unless uh, Polish, Baltic states, Scandinavian, Dutch, Romanian protest, uh, he would be invited. But now we have the uh, project of centralization of the European Union in which the decisions within the realm of the common foreign security policy uh, are expected to be taken by the majority voting. You had the majority voting system in the EU based on the direct proportion between the power of the votes and the number of population. So 84 millions of Germans and 67 millions of French could overvote almost everybody. And if you add to those the Mediterranean uh, lobby, that means uh, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, with obvious and natural, I, I'm not... Uh, offended by that fact. It's natural. If I were Italian, I would do the same. But their priority is in the middle, is in Mediterranean region. And of course, they will vote uh, to um, take the resources to solve those problems and not the problems in the East. Uh, and uh, we have already heard, yeah, and it's true that uh, in Italy there are those posters, Russia is not your enemy. Yeah? Uh, that's the entire campaign. Uh, and we still remember uh, that, uh, well, uh, we have uh, two chancellors of Austria, uh, the, uh, Wolfgang Schiesel and uh, Chris uh, Kneisel, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria, that one dancing with Putin, and we had the Prime Minister of Sweden, Goran Persson, and the Prime Minister of Finland, uh, Lipo pa uh, Pavel Liponen, uh, and the brother of the, uh, gen uh, of the um, um, chief of staff of the French army, Philippe de uh, Veilleur, all of them involved with businesses with Russia. And of course, Schroeder is the symbol, maybe remote in time today, but still in SPD. Yeah. Uh, today, if we look into that project of centralization of the uh, European Union, uh, which is unrightfully called federalization, uh, we will see the uh, project of uh, Helmut Scholz, don't mix with Olaf Scholz, I'm not talking about Chancellor, about the German member of European Parliament, Olaf Scholz, from uh, SAD, from the former DDR, uh, the uh, man who was uh, graduated from GIMO, uh, and his recommendation is uh, to get rid of NATO. The European Union should uh, decouple from NATO mm, and be independent, which is perfectly what Russia is dreaming about. Yeah? So the problem is uh, that uh, if Russia is not able to uh, act uh, directly, it's perfect in uh, acting indirectly under uh, foreign flag, uh, exploiting uh, different ideas, uh, and uh, this European idea, which is in uh, this deep core sense, very positive, but still vulnerable for this time of uh, manipulation, which are more and more effective. We still remember that we had four common spaces with whom? With Russia, 2003, 2005. Yeah, the partnership for uh, modernization. Moderna, modernization of what? Europe taught modernization of Russia. Russia taught modernization of Russian army. Yeah, that was the yeah that was the, the, the real goal yeah uh, and all those narratives today we have to expect what we will be told or are being told today each war is ended with negotiations really no a lot of wars ends with annihilation of one of the uh, belligerents that's our experience of war uh, especially war with Russia uh, that, uh, well, uh, that is something, I've, please correct me if I am wrong, but uh, it was uh, done for, uh, for Germans. Uh, you should not uh, humiliate a great nation, 
because Germany were humiliated in Versailles and then they created Third Reich and you know. So now Russia should not be humiliated because they get crazy and created Russian Third Reich. No, it was not the humiliation. Germany were humiliated in 1945 even deeper. It was the hope for successful revenge that was the engine of the Second World War. Uh, and Russia must be showed uh, that uh, there is no hope for successful revenge. Because Russia lost the Cold War in a way in which Germany lost the First World War. No foreign soldier entered Russian territory and they lost a lot of its imperial space. And uh, this is still important, I think. Uh, we will be told uh, that uh, basic thing is to end killings in Ukraine. Do you think so? That when uh, we have armistice, the, the killings is over? It's not our experience. Ask Estonians, ask Poles, ask uh, Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, whether people are killed first of all on the battlefields or in prisons and forests and in Gulag system. This is the main area of extermination. And the end of hostilities on the front line will not mean the end of killings. And uh, Ukraine is not uh, Eastern Germany. R Russia never had the ambition to Russify Eastern Germans, but they have, Russia has the ambition to Russify Ukrainians. After 40 years, there will be no Ukrainians on the occupied territories, just Russians. All the elites will be exterminated. This is why mobile crematorias were took with Russian army at the beginning of the invasion. There is a special Russian word, I hope you will understand, Obeskovlenie. What does it mean? Decaptization. And we experienced that kind of war since 15th century. All the time is the same. Whether you see the uh, hands tied uh, behind the back from Bucha or from Katyn, it's still the same. Uh, it's not new epoch. So please remember this kind of message which, will, which cannot be sent directly uh, from Russia to Poland or to other countries. Could be sent via Brussels or via Germany or via pacifist from the West uh, saying to us that we are bad Europeans, we are Russophobic, we don't understand the need of peace and so on. Uh, and the last sentence, I guess, yeah, because I am running out of time. What Russia exploits very much as well, it's history of conflicts between us. It's history of conflicts between Poles and Ukrainians, Slovaks and Hungarians, uh, Romanians and Hungarians, and so on. Uh, and we have to be aware of that fact that whatever our ancestors did to each other, we are not in a position to uh, start a quarrel about that, because we are military threat today and for tomorrow, but the real enemy that can kill our compatriots today and not eight years ago or somewhere in the history. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I can't help but agree that European leadership is uh, still lacking and arguably we need it now more than uh, ever in our contemporary or modern history. Uh, but I would like to now give the uh, word to uh, Bianca Tuma. And, uh, we should have a presentation any moment. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I told Todor um, um, congratulations for this gathering because uh, it was that interesting that I interesting that I drove six hours from Bucharest to, to join you today. Um, and uh, because I was very much interested to see lots of panelists, lots of uh, um, transsectorial expertise because this information is about a lot of expertise from lots of fields. Uh, my slice of, um, of the story uh, would be about, uh, about the EU and uh, how EU related this information uh, went through the general public, how 
how was impactful because not all of the fake news of disinformation spread around during this year's election but also during the last two years as our monitoring report shows have been impactful so uh, to our mind it was very important to see which kind of disinformation and what kind of fake news have been believed, endorsed, engaged, and so on. Um, uh, what was worrying for us in 2012 when we, in 2022 when we, uh, we started this monitoring, um, annual monitoring report, but now it will be um, more frequently, it was the fact that citizens citizens of, of Romania, but it's, it's the case of all countries, do not know what to believe anymore. If you are looking at the surveys, public opinion polls, and we did that for our research here and there, uh, if you ask them about the EU, you'll see a bunch of 30% of the people who said yes. For instance, did Romania benefit from the EU or not? 30% will say yes. 20% will say no, but over 50% will say, I don't know what to believe. And this bunch of people, more and more on different topics, on, on, on uh, relate, EU related, being in this bubble of thinking which is right or which is wrong, is something that should be worrying. Um, what else have been doing for, not only for this monitoring report, but this one is more, uh, let's say, uh, spectacular because it was an electoral year. In Romania we have had uh, 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 EU elections and now we are, um, we are preparing for impact with the national election and the presidential election. So uh, it was uh, uh, much more interesting, uh, uh, let's say. But we, we have been also looking at the um, how different actors have been behaved in, in an online uh, environment, Be because this is also interesting to see how media has done on this, how the political leaders being far right or being mainstream have been endorsed or engaged in the debates uh, or have been even riding the waves of, uh, of this information because of the audience. And then um, how much the public communication has been there because, thank you, <laughs> thank you, because this information is getting ground as much as the information is not there. So basically, uh, this is what we have been looking at and it's a very brief slice of, uh, of our um, narrative impact. These were the main issues that we have been looking in 2003, uh, 2023 and 24. Um, basically audiences of this and misinformation, EU related, but you can, <laughs> you can put everything you need to know. Um, and also um, we have been looking at also strategic topics such as war in Ukraine, uh, different crises, COVID crisis um, and so on. Um, so anti-EU narrative most frequently disseminated over the last years in uh, social networks, uh, online TV. Um, case studies, uh, who were the influencers on key topics, information and disinformation. Even though they are not comparable because they have different audiences in terms of what we have had on the table in, in data analysis uh, was, uh, was uh, interesting for us. Uh, analysis of audience peaks and overlaps with key political moments on the public agenda. Kate studies and mentions with strong impact. Of course, we, will, we won't have time to look into the details. The report is also available. A little bit of context for Romania and what is also worrying, uh, the largest increase of far right votes in Europe um, with almost 20%. Uh, of course, in 2019, we have had none, so yeah. Um, also, two worrying trends about the youth uh, voting preferences and uh, youth voting intentions. 23% of young people who express an intention to vote indicated nationalists. 
And when asked why, because they are on TikTok. So, um, what we have also seen um, um, during our uh, public opinion polls is a significant decline in the EU trust among Romanian citizens following the start of the pandemic. That was a turning point. Um, luckily, we are still pro-Europeans and um, of course, if, um, we we have um, we have reason to 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 be uh, to believe that Romanians are still on the EU side, but the trend is worrying, and I think that we should put more resources in um, in looking at it and uh, better communicating to key stakeholders. This is all just one of the toxic element uh, uh, spread around and uh, artificially amplified by different actors. Uh, I will be talking about the lack of uh, resources in terms of analyzing, and when, when, I, when, I, when I'm saying analyzing, to give a quick analyze of the content, or whether it is, is, uh, is uh, organic or is, um, um, is fake or is amplified. Um, so one of the toxic meta narrative is, of course, about the EU uh, collapsing, have been circulated among different sources, um, and we believe that there is an increased uh, artificial um, uh, amplified uh, content because we have seen a lot of. Sorry, I run a little bit faster. <laughs> Not that fast, please. I think we, I should go back. Yeah, I will wait for you. So, um, um, of course, that uh, um, topics, so we have been looking at different to topics um, uh, relevant for the EU, strategies, policies, um, um, crisis responses. Uh, some of them um, have been target, uh, targeted by this information, by far right, but you're by, uh, by different political actors. Some of them not. For instance, we do not have the anti-refugee sentiment. We do not have um, anti-migrants narrative. There are some, but they're not, not necessarily relevant in terms of impact on an audience. But definitely, uh, there have been some, some cases that were, uh, they were surprising for us, uh, such as um, um, digital services. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just an example. Uh, just an example about the climate dictatorship. I think uh, it's also the case for Bulgaria. Uh, how this narrative has been circulated, um, um, the conspiracy theory um, um, uh, leaders are, uh, and also, of course, the political uh, leaders from far right are spreading a lot uh, disinformation and misinformation about uh, about the Green Deal, um, false claims on EU mess, uh, on EU measures, and um, but we what we have seen, and I think that this slide is very relevant. Um, you'll have on the one side how this information has been spread, and on the other side how information has been spread. So where where um, it was a lot of information about the Green Deal, uh, you, you have seen endorsements, you have seen highlights, you have seen a lot of of of, of content. Um, where um, of course the the climate dictatorship, um, even though has its adepts. <laughs> has not been uh, that impactful. Um, what what also helped in uh, in during last year uh, was um, a turning point for the um, uh, for the social networks. Uh, Google, for instance, uh, did that during uh, the uh, during uh, this year's election, ranking uh, the sources, the main sources, the EU sources, ranking them uh, first. Which was um, which was indeed interesting uh, to see, and these are some uh, let's say captured um, uh, topics and uh, EU policies by conspiracy theorists, 
um, we wouldn't believe without uh, looking, uh, without paying attention to, this, uh, to these targets. Um, basically, top 20 uh, people talking in the internet about uh, about the digital services such as um, uh, EID or digital wallet or digital services um, um, are people coming from the far right and uh, conspiracy theorists uh, adepts. Worrying is that um, more and more policies have been blocked by this kind of people and by the political mainstream because of the voice of the internet. And this is, um, this is the third case this year, uh, the conspiracy of eliminating cash. The government, of course, wanted to, um, uh, to make a little bit of um, uh, uh, limitation in circulating cash. Um, and uh, the Facebook and the internet explode uh, and of course, the government uh, uh, had to, uh, to to make a step back, which, in terms of um, uh, taking decisions by uh, looking at the internet, I think is also a trend that we should be uh, we should be uh, worried. So, in short, because uh, um, I've been told that I have seven to ten minutes, so uh, I, I use my my background of journalist, so uh, I think I'm almost there. Uh, key takeaways from our from this kind from our monitoring reports and um, uh, working also closely with the media. Uh, truth is lacking infrastructure, at, at least in Romania. Um, of course, social media networks and their algorithms uh, are part are a big part of the problem. Uh, let's hope for the best after the DSA will be um, will be enforced. Um, rising influence of, of TikTok. Let's hope for the best after the content will be moderated. But there are still things that we should be working on, at like gaps and irrelevance of public communication. This information is getting wrong because the information is not there, and we have been working exactly on these narratives with different kinds of audiences, and we have been seeing that information is not there. Um, and it's also part of the atomization of the press because they, 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 they just they don't have time and they don't have power and they do not have enough resources to cover and to simply explain key and uh, um, essential policies that will be uh, will be followed. Political communication, of course, they are riding the wave of, uh, of not of the populism, but uh, if a, a topic has have traction, they will be there. Um, political communication tend to be both inadequate and, and uh, um, repetitive. This deficiency creates a vacuum that allows this information to, uh, to thrive. Uh, coordinated, uh, consistent, and proactive messages from the local uh, politicians and also from the European politicians helps. We have seen that or when um, uh, disinformation is uh, spreaded and, and uh, mainstream politicians are there to counter it, it have, has impact. And last but not least, we are, we are witnessing a toxic media phenomenon of political advertising, basically Mainstream politicians um, are buying uh, messages, um, um, slots, uh, explaining uh, uh, when when it's it, it is when serves their their interest, uh, explaining uh, different uh, policies, different assessments of the European Commission. It was the case of this year of the CVM report. You know that Bulgaria and Romania have had the cooperation and verification mechanism. Uh, it was ended and another report uh, came in place. It was, let's say, um, a positive report where our politicians bought advertising uh, in media, uh, which significantly contributes to decline in public trust because nobody, and, and the, usually they are not using this public uh, advertisement uh, in and outside the, the, the electoral periods. Um, um, significantly um, um, 
uh, affect the trust in, in, in uh, mainstream communication channels. Among the, the last legitimate uh, channels to, um, to play a role in countering disinformation. Um, this is in brief the, the, the landscape that we have been, we have been seeing. Uh, what I didn't mention is that we need to bring more technology in looking at those things. Um, we are still, still lacking in um, putting resources together. We need, I would say, and also it's the case for media, we need accessible technology uh, to analyze these trends, to be more present, uh, to be quick, uh, and to not to be reactive, but to be proactive, because once the intoxication of the collective mind is there, it's very hard to, to, to get a treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. I, I can only hope that both of our countries take advantage of the strategic MOU that we signed earlier this year and uh, fight the challenges that you mentioned together. Uh, but next, I would like to invite uh, Andre from uh, uh, Watchdog to uh, come and speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. I'll try to be quick and uh, keep uh, the conversation flowing. Moldova has been in the news for all the wrong reasons uh, lately. Everybody loves an underdog that's winning against Russia, but is it really winning right now? Uh, let's start with some numbers. 130,000 uh, accounts created in a Russian bank that cannot operate in Moldova. Around uh, uh, 300 uh, uh, young people uh, who went to Russia, went, were radicalized, were trained in, in camps to uh, become operatives to handle small weapons, drones, explosives, and uh, to control crowds and at protests. Uh, around 200 priests who were sent to Russia for pilgrimages and who, according to investigative journalists, are getting 1,000 euros per month to get to spread uh, disinformation around the European Union. Uh, bloggers, influencers who are on the Russian payroll to spread the same time of, of, uh, of uh, uh, disinformation, even uh, uh, public persons from Romania, some uh, singing Manele or, or other type of, of music who need to support one or another candidate. All of this uh, on the backdrop of uh, a government that is not very popular, has gone through f four crises. Uh, COVID, the start of the war, Moldova is very logistically linked to the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, um, economy, uh, energy blackmail from Russia, and then the refugee crisis. This all created the perfect storm that Russia wanted to uh, uh, turn this uh, foreign influence and uh, uh, manipulation to actual regime, regime change, and all, only the uh, mobilization of the whole society uh, has countered that and has uh, made it possible for the pro-European referendum to, to pass and for the uh, uh, President Maya Sandu to stay in power. But right now what the pro-Russian forces are saying is that if we cannot uh, uh, influence the whole society, let's change what society is trying to uh, cut out the possibility for the uh, diaspora to vote as uh, they are less likely to be manipulated and influenced by this uh, uh, system. What is interesting about this uh, in terms of disinformation is that all of these people uh, um, numbered around 300,000 were both uh, receivers but also amplifiers of disinformation. They would all uh, have different tasks around the, the uh, uh, structure created by the fugitive oligarch Shore to uh, come to protests, to comment online, to spread information within their, their circles, to recruit new people and to indoctrinate them with the uh, anti-European narratives and anti-government narratives and so on. This was all uh, created around the uh, ecosystem of telegram channels, influencers, some online and offline television uh, stations and uh, a general uh, uh, feeling that is, uh, they're trying to create around the necessity to, to show that Moldova is xenophobic, Moldova is Russophobic, that that type of narrative is 
said at every of Maria Zakharova's uh, uh, brief, uh, press briefings in every week we have a, a running uh, a wager at, at the office when she will not mention Moldova uh, during her uh, speeches and she never fails to. The possibility for uh, such a uh, situation to uh, be countered is quite slim. What we have uh, tried to do as an NGO was create a, uh, a platform called Citizens for Europe. We went to more than 100 villages and cities and talked uh, to, to people about the myths around European integration. Uh, being a uh, civil society platform, we could not uh, advocate to vote yes or no, but we could say this is what Europe is really about, go and vote and uh, be mindful about it. We are quite uh, uh, realistic about the, our uh, uh, role in this. Uh, it hasn't been a, a game changer, but it has been a experience that we learned from. Many of us live in, in, in echo chambers and information bubbles, and we think that everything that we know and perceive is perceived the, the same way, I don't know, in villages and rural areas of, uh, of different countries. But think about this system that uh, is created in Moldova, and think about your own countries. How many of the uh, people in your countries would accept a bribe of 50 to 100 euros to change their vote? And I think especially in this region that would be a lot. And uh, this started at the regional level, where the vote doesn't seem to count too much. And people were radicalized and uh, have been driven into more and more uh, activism. Uh, many of these people being uh, elderly without many activities to, to have. So with lots of social exclusion going around, with people who didn't really have a purpose in life, and they found this purpose through uh, participating in this scheme. Uh, right now, uh, the, the main narratives that uh, are driving the, the discourse uh, further is that uh, diaspora should not have a, a role to, to participate in the Moldovan election, that uh, uh, Moldova is deeply divided and it's half uh, uh, of the population against EU and half for EU but not taking into account that up to 15% of the population that voted was bribed. Uh, that Moldova isn't necessarily a functioning uh, um, uh, electoral democracy. Here I would also have uh, some questions about uh, how good, would, how well would a uh, country from the European Union resist to a operation that is uh, uh, um, amassed to have had a budget of over 100 million euros. And uh, what results would we see in, in uh, such an election for a, even a bigger or, or a more resilient country than Moldova? Right now, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, correct those approaches that, that were not necessarily perceived in, in the society, try to talk to those people who were part of this, show that the, they're, they're part of the society and people care about them, try to uh, have a community reached out to them, and especially that uh, right now there is a big uh, legal process that is happening around this. Uh, unfortunately, the scheme was not protecting them very well, so at least 130,000 people need to be either fined or brought before justice, and that would uh, radicalize them even more. And what do you do ar around this, and how do you take those people from this uh, uh, vicious cycle and actually get them back to, to the society? We're trying to amplify the messaging around uh, a uh, civil consensus that most of these people are uh, victims rather than uh, willing participants. Uh, trying to, to uh, reshape uh, the, the narrative that it's not about uh, a natural uh, segmentation of the uh, society, but rather a uh, um, artificially driven, uh, 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 filled by, by Russian disinformation, uh, Russophobia that, that is, is uh, uh, portrayed in Moldova, and trying to talk to those who fell into this trap and were saying, like, why, why do Russians decide for us, and how do we uh, see that uh, uh, this is not happening anymore? Uh, this driving especially Russian speakers and then those who had pro-European views, to the other side, saying, uh, if I'm going to be discriminated by this uh, pro-European movement, why should I be a part of it? Uh, 
all of these elements uh, show many of the uh, the things that our my colleague said before. Uh, for Moldova, uh, all the uh, political process uh, have been securitized, and I don't think we're going to have a, a uh, simpler election in the next 10 years. There's always going to be a, a bribing and some kind of uh, pressure to make sure that Moldova does not enter European Union and is not closer to the European Union in a way that is uh, more uh, resilient, more economically developed, more uh, um, uh, prosperous, so that uh, the same uh, sums of money are not that interesting to, to those people. Uh, a very interesting role for uh, the so-called uh, legacy media or traditional media. Now with uh, Trump's election, that, that term uh, uh, might be shifting even more. Uh, in, in Moldova, that we had the, the human side of this uh, uh, system uncovered by two uh, uh, investigative journalists that went undercover and actually uh, have been part of this uh, uh, structure for months. They show, uh, showed us uh, the actual mechanism, how they recruit their systems, that you uh, become a sympathizer, then you become an activist, then you become a leader, very uh, similar to what uh, multi-level mar marketing uh, companies have or the mafia has. Uh, all of these uh, um, elements creates the, the question, whether now we are talking about uh, uh, foreign interference or actual soft power takeover in, in the Republic of Moldova. And uh, that's why I started my uh, discussion with, or my monologue in a way, with uh, the question, are we winning? Or is this a Pyrrhic victory? Because uh, we know that such a mobilization as we had, especially in the diaspora, is hard to replicate. Uh, what we are trying to do now is shift the perspective from uh, 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 fighting and and uh, and, uh, uh, and us versus them mentality to a social consensus that we are under siege and we should act as a society, uh, help the uh, 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 law enforcement authorities uh, disseminate the messaging around uh, the fact that if you come clean, you will not be punished because that's in, in the legislation actually in the Republic of Moldova for the low level uh, people I implicated into this. Uh, try to uh, send the message about the, the, the wrongs that the government was doing and not uh, portray them as only the good guys. The, the uh, situation is never as black and white as, as uh, people would want to portray it. And uh, um, since we're an advocacy uh, platform, we also want to, to uh, uh, say this message loud and clear. Moldova is not gonna make it on its own. Uh, if there are uh, operatives that are being trained in Serbia and Bosnia, and Serbia and Bosnia doesn't even inform the Moldovan authorities on this, this is a problem. If uh, uh, there is information about uh, money being uh, funneled into Moldova, including through European Union, and our European partners do not uh, share with us that information, that's a problem. If uh, we don't get the needed economic, logistical information support, this uh, 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 so, uh, so much winning, as, as Trump used to say, uh, is going to end. And uh, the uh, outlook after our election was kind of hopeful, after Trump's uh, uh, re-election, or election, I don't know how to call it, it's a bit more grim. So my uh, uh, perspective is that we had a whole of society approach, and now we need whole of a continent approach to, to fight this uh, type of uh, action, or we'll fail one by one. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I'm sure I speak on behalf of uh, most of us when I say that we look forward to uh, welcoming Moldova and the Union. Um, uh, for our second to last presentation now, we'll get a perspective from the uh, private sector. Uh, so what I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Lesplingard from Czech first. Thank you. If I could have my slide, please. Hello, I will start by a premise. I promise you in 15 minutes you will get a coffee. So that's a good beginning. 
Uh, so let's talk about the role of communities in tackling disinformation and foreign influence. For that, I would like to use an example that we have worked on, which is uh, the operation overload. First, we need to state something which is obvious but still needs to be stated. Civil society plays a crucial role in combating foreign influence. We can, quote the we can name the last, uh, the last operation that, that have been uh, managed, not to name it Doppelganger, the Celebrity Network, Paper Wall, or No Embargo at Shift, which have been uh, investigated by amazing organizations such as the EU Disinfo Lab, DFR Lab, Reset Tech, AI Forensic, or Logically. Let's talk about Operation Overload. First, what is Operation Overload? It starts by something very easy. It's an email that you received every day to start with. The, the, the emails are always the same. It starts with a sen sensationalist subject like, hey, could you check this for me, please? It comes always from a normal email address. It's a Gmail address. Like here, we can see Philippe Modera. Yeah, it's a normal name. And then you have like all those Telegram links, all those inks, X link, all those website links, and those media that, that you can find in the email with video and attachment. And it's always the same tone, like, hey, could you do that for me, please? Could you verify that for me? At the very beginning, it was one email per day. But start it soon, soon it started to be way more than one email per day. So the question was like, I asked my colleague like from another organization, hey, do you receive also those weird emails, or is it just us? Because Check First is not a fact-checking organization. We are never published any fact-checking. We are not verifying anything, although they were still asking us. And yeah, actually, my colleague from another organization was also receiving this email. So I was like, well, maybe I should ask to more organizations, do you also receive those emails? And actually, yes, and it wasn't only email. It was email received by organization, but those organization was also pinged on X, for example. Like, hey, could you verify this for me? One time, two time, three time, five time per day. All this content produced always with the same target, fact checkers and media organization. Operation Overload is still an ongoing operation, and it's a large-scale operation coming from Russia. In June, when we started our first report, 20 organizations were targeted by Operation Overload, a bunch of them already. Three months later, 200 of them are targeted. We had a list of 200 organizations that every day received email asking them to verify information which are basically false for, to start with. That takes time to verify all those things. If you look at numbers, it's 245 emails that were sent last month, without counting this month. It's 17,000 emails that were sent containing false information, and more than 300 debunks that have been published on those claims. I'm not going to talk about Telegram. It's a problem. I'm not talking about X. It's an issue. You can find all the narrative on those platforms. But what are the techniques used by Operation Overload? And this is a very interesting one. First, there is something which is quite new, which is called content amalgamation. What is that? Let's say I want you to believe into something. I'm, I've done study in marketing, I've done my exams, and I know that if I want you to believe in my brand, I need to t touch you through three different vectors. So I will run advertisement on TV then I will run advertisement on radio, and then I will run advertisement on social media. So the next time that you will hear the name of my brand, you will know about it, and you would feel comfortable with the idea of my brand. Russia just applied this marketing technique to disinformation. They will create a fake video speaking about a topic, then do a screenshot about this fake video, then create fake Instagram or TikTok story talking about this event and can even go to, go to fake graffiti or, do, or doctorate photo as a cheap or deep fake on the narrative. All of them, why? It's a trap. It's for fact checkers because you see that content, you're like, oh, but I saw that over there, I, and I saw that over there. Oh, oh my God, it, it's everywhere. I need to talk about it. Well, no, you don't need. It's just content amalgamation. It's basically the same content which is reused reused, reused in different contexts to give you the impression that this content is everywhere. But it's absolutely not. Another 
goal of content amalgamation, it's also something that we don't talk enough. It's about domestic influence. Operation overload starts always from the same point. It starts on Telegram channels which are pro-Russian, pro-Kremlin. And the disinformation is published in Russian before being translated in English or national language where the target is. Second technique, very interesting and very dangerous, and please, please, please listen to this part, QR code. QR code are very dangerous. The first uh, occurrence of QR code for, was found in June, and at the beginning we saw one post with one QR code. We warned the entire community, pay attention, QR codes are very dangerous because you can change the content of a QR code. When you scan a QR code, you can see the URL. You will scan the QR code and go to this URL. You don't know what's behind. They can load malware for you. So far, not. But they understood that. One month after, two months after, that we, we said, take care about the QR code. Now you will find hundreds of posts from Operation Overload that contain those QR codes. Because they have understood that people are actually scanning those QR codes. They are looking at the website which is behind. And so using them again and again, proving their adaptability and how they can change their tactic very, very fast. So the question was, how are we going to fight that? It's not illegal to send an email. It's not illegal to ping someone on X asking them to verify. There is nothing illegal over there. But we can talk with the target. As the target was the fact checkers and media organization, we decided with EU Design Lab and Reset Tech to bring on the table everybody. And before releasing our report, to have a discussion with all the fact checkers that were targeted, explaining to them, you are receiving those emails, you are pinged on X, you are seeing those narratives on Telegram. It's all the same thing. Everything belongs to this operation overload. Please do not amplify it. This is the goal. The goal is for, for you to talk about it. What, what, what's the result of this? Is that more content that we could analyze from Operation Overload. And when we looked at the content, well, this is an email from February 2024 between Correctives, uh, the, the, the German fact checkers, and Operations Overload uh, uh, operator. So first, you can see the, uh, at the bottom of the screen the original email. Would you be kind enough to check this news? Corrective, nicely enough in February, answer them. Oh, OK, this is a fake news. You can find it there and there. And this is their answer. In fact, I would like to send this to news organization, to other organizations for verification. OK, interesting. Maybe if you have a link to the article, I could help to spread it. So nice of them, they want to help us. Of course, we are going to do something with you. But if you look at the email details, you can see that the date is actually written in Russian. <laughs> if you look at the content of the email, sometimes you receive it in English, as we do, but sometimes the translation is not working, you're receiving it in Russian. So, the question after that is, that what did we achieve by doing that? Because there is always the question of, why are you doing that? First, Operation Overload was recognized as a threat by the European Union and the Commission in one of their press releases. They recognized Doppelganger and as Overload as threat for the European election. The download, the, our report has been downloaded 60,000 60, times, which is the most downloaded report that we have ever seen. We have, uh, we have had a worldwide, uh, worldwide press coverage that, uh, that helped us to raise awareness among the communities. The result, Overload did fuck during the uh, European election. Nothing happened. All the narrative was dead. After well, one week before the beginning of the election, they already, they already switched to something else. Same for the Olympics. They tried many, many, many narratives against the Paris Olympic didn't work because all the French fact checkers was absolutely aware that it was Operation Overload and there was no need to amplify those narratives by fact checking them. If we, uh, that's the word of uh, Nathalie uh, Tagerfisch, which is the news, uh, the, the head of the newsroom of uh, Check That in uh, Sweden, I think, uh, explaining that be 
because of our report, that's how they were able to raise awareness amongst their community and to avoid having to basically do this work of fact check and every each and every claim, amplifying them one by one. But we didn't work only with the fact checkers and I want here to raise that point that we also need to work with the platforms. Here our issue was on Gmail. Gmail is not a very large online platform, it's just a platform under the DSA. It's important to communicate with the platforms to be able to basically start to tackle the issue with them. The community is not only CSO, civil society organization, fact checkers and platforms and policy makers, the community is a whole. We need together to talk every time at every step. It's very important. Keep on fighting. Yes, as I told you, well, Operation Overload is still very, very active. I just received like five mail, I think, this morning. They are very happy about the results of the US election, of course, and totally switched their narrative into something else. They are back <coughs> to the anti-Ukrainian narratives. During the, 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 the US campaign, we have seen many, many, many narratives against Kalama Harris, known against Donald Trump. The results are, I will let you decide what it is. But the difference between Europe and the US was that in Europe, we warned everybody. Everybody was really aware of what was Operation Overload and what was their goal. In the US, we tried to reach, to, to bring this kind of awareness, and unfortunately, we couldn't. And I will just show you this little screenshot, which is a statement from the FBI explaining that two videos that have been produced are actually not true video from the FBI. Just by doing this statement, the, the posts that were containing the video before the statement had approximately 1,000 views. After the statement, it get 100,000 views. So we really must stay alert and understand how this works. Little extra bonus, because I, I like to talk about that. So we published the, the report uh, about doppelgangers and our friend from Russia just winked at us by spoofing our identity. So you can see Operation Overload spoofing BBC, TF1, big US organization, and also don'tly check first. Remember, we don't publish fact check, we don't publish video, we are a CSO, we don't do that. So when Russian not happy, Russians do that. Thank you so much for your attention. Please do not hesitate to scan this QR code to download our report. <laughs> and, to, and I'm happy to take a question. Thank you, Amaury. Uh, and for a last presentation, I'd like to welcome my colleague and fellow analyst from CSD, Maria Stoyanova. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be part of this panel today. And uh, actually, we will conclude the panel where we started it, and we will talk about the importance of adequate financing of uh, media and media freedom in Europe as a crucial component in building this resilience against uh, disinformation. So, the media plays a crucial role in building democratic resilience against disinformation and manipulation of information. And this issue has been raised uh, and highlighted several times today. And independent journalism, we must recognize that it has always served as an anti antidote to uh, information manipulation and other tactics that are intended to somehow disrupt the uh, information space. Unfortunately, it is now evident that the Europe's media landscape is weakened, and this is fueling the tsunami of uh, disinformation and misinformation that we are experiencing. And uh, as media pluralism is reaching its lowest points, we see uh, a significant spark in um, disinformation. Um, despite the efforts to counter it, 
Uh, one aspect that is often overlooked is the financial instability that is facing the news media. And I'm glad that Ms. Mr. Dragomir already mentioned and raised some of the uh, crucial challenges that are faced today by the news media in Europe. Uh, and partly he, he addressed some of the points that I also mentioned in my presentation. But generally, uh, an unstable media uh, landscape and ecosystem uh, where independent journalism is not able to perform its role as a watchdog enables and, uh, uh, the misinformation to thrive. So today I have the honor to share some of the uh, findings from research that uh, CSD has been doing over the past year. And uh, since we're talking about building European holistic approach to these issues that are absolutely cross-border and cannot be uh, faced solely by member states, uh, I will uh, focus on the EU responses uh, to these issues uh, and we'll try to assess uh, their success and also their limitations and to conclude with some potential solutions that we uh, are trying to put forward in the agenda of the upcoming, like the newly formed, currently forming European Commission. Um, so, we already uh, highlighted the challenges, the main challenges that are facing the, the media sector in Europe, so I'm not going to repeat them again, but Generally, the main issue is that the traditional business models that supported uh, the media sector and the media industry are disrupted, they're heavily damaged, and one of the big reasons is, of course, the digital transition, the increasing role of social media and digital platforms that are taking huge part of the revenues, the advertising revenues that once the media relied on, to support themselves financially. So this digital transition is not something new, but still the sector is adapting themselves and we see different uh, degrees of success in different parts uh, and regions uh, of Europe. Um, so this is combined with the competition for public attention that is more fierce than ever. The abundance of digital content makes it difficult for high quality and uh, content that is actually complying to journalistic standards. It requires um, time to be produced to compete with the fast paced information flow in the, in the digital world uh, that is filled with sensationalist clickbait, deep fakes and uh, uh, basically information pollution that is spread, uh, is, is spreading like disinformation and uh, misleading messages. Um, so we observed this shift in the audience and behavior. We already mentioned that more and more people were using uh, the internet to, to access uh, uh, news content, to consume news. Uh, we al already mentioned again the, the fatigue uh, among a growing part of the population, uh, like they're feeling lost in this battle for truth, uh, and they're just unwilling to, like, to get informed, and they prefer to, uh, uh, to turn to alternative sources like influencers and, uh, and so on to, to get informed, um, which of course is a reliable source of information, and Journalists are uh, increasingly losing jobs. Uh, journalists are uncompetitive in, in, this, in this environment. Um, another phenomenon that we are observing is the so-called news desert that is the result of this uh, market failure because the best way to describe the environment right now is market failure because uh, Basically, the traditional business models are not uh, working anymore, but they are not largely repli replaced by new models, which leads to uh, many newsrooms, especially small 
and medium-sized uh, lo local news rooms uh, are forced to close, uh, and this leaves huge regions without proper covering of community uh, community uh, level reporting uh, and uh, less scrutiny on the local, local level. Um, the Mark, the other part, category of challenges, uh, again we mentioned it, it is the uh, media capture that is manifested uh, differently, but I don't want to repeat what we uh, have already said. It is uh, observed in uh, regions, uh, like uh, in our region much more, uh, much more than uh, in, in Western European uh, part of the in the Western Europe, European part. Um, the, the conclusion is that the economic pressures and financial instability uh, is among the main vulnerabilities uh, and as in many other areas in life, the real independence starts with the financial independence of the sector. Uh, and uh, just to illustrate this, we have prepared several graphs that uh, show the, uh, ad the growth of advertising revenue of digital platforms, in this case Meta, uh, which was uh, once the main source of profit for newsrooms, uh, and at the same time the declining revenues of both uh, press, uh, printed and digital uh, media in Europe. I will uh, go through these graphs very, very quickly. Uh, again, these show uh, the changing patterns of news media consumption in the EU, demonstrating the growing use of digital, uh, of, of the internet to access news. So the EU has recognized this, that this is uh, critical to support media, and uh, it has initiated several uh, regulatory and policy initiatives over the years. Uh, Ms. Dana Spinant from the European Commission in the opening session, she mentioned some of them and the most significant ones. So uh, now we have this legal and policy framework that is in place, uh, especially the Digital Services Act, the European Freedom Act, uh, the updated copyright directive, uh, the anti slap directive, the give us uh, the legal tools to support media. Um, so all these mark significant steps, but their harmonization uh, yeah, remains challenging. And the biggest challenge is actually engaging big tech to comply with the provisions under them. Um, I don't have much time, so I'll go very, very briefly through the other slides. Um, so, apart from the regulatory initiatives, uh, the EU has uh, provided financial support to the media sector through a very complex scheme of uh, funding programs. As you can see, um, most, of the, uh, most of them uh, are dispersed and in, in very fragmented under different DGs. And uh, the, effective, the effectiveness of these efforts has been hindered by the lack of coordination. And uh, yeah, they didn't manage to, uh, to gain significant, significant results um, because of this fragmentation. Um, so a key issue is that we have identified is, um, uh, yeah. This is the, uh, the scheme, uh, as you can see, uh, the many different programs that support somehow media-related projects that are operated by the EU, uh, but most, uh, mostly the, the major ones are Horizon Europe, Creative Europe, uh, and uh, yeah, due to the fragmentation, it's actually very difficult to estimate the uh, amount of financial support that is there uh, some uh, suggest the number of 50 million per year dedicated to the media sector, but it is uh, uh, very, very insufficient compared to other critical sectors. Um, so falling short, 
I will skip some slides. Falling short, uh, we should recognize the uh, consistent efforts that the EU uh, had, ha have had uh, to support media freedom, spe specifically the news media sector, but there are significant gaps that are still remaining. Uh, and uh, one of them is that uh, there is widely inadequate distribution of the uh, funding. We have identified different patterns of the allocation of the funds that are largely fav favoring uh, the so-called le uh, legacy media organizations that are uh, mainly um, located in Western European countries. Um, so, for example, the news initiative, which is one of the few examples that is addressing specifically the news media sector. Uh, over the past three years, it has funded um, around 20, 28 projects uh, and 54% of the, the whole funding, which amounts to the full funding for the whole project is around 25 billion uh, euros and 54% are of the total funding is uh, actually directed to four countries, uh, like Italy, Germany, France, and Belgium, which are uh, all located in the, uh, in the Western Europe. And uh, basically, the current EU approach to finance media relying basically mostly on grants, uh, yes, uh, is unable to tackle uh, pressuring, pressuring issues in the our region in the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, also, the market failure remains unaddressed because it is not encouraging enough private capital in the sector, and the uh, big tech companies that have had major impact uh, are not engaged as well sufficiently. Um, so, we Uh, we have uh, prepared a policy agenda, a set of recommendations. Uh, unfortunately, I will not have time to go through them, but uh, we are suggesting um, mobilizing both private and public capital, uh, blending finance to address, this, uh, to, to address these challenges. Uh, that is coordinated at the European level. Uh, so through the use and allocation of planned finance, uh, they can support um, the, the, the media sector uh, more securely. Um, and this can be achieved by the creation of a blended finance platform, uh, which where independent outlets can access funding uh, in different types of capital to uh, implement different projects. Another approach is to replicate or to already build, to build to already uh, uh, existing uh, financial instruments to support, to support media that uh, are, for example, modeled after the Jeremy, uh, the, the Jeremy tool, which is no longer operational, but it has been used to support small and media enterprises and startups through loans, equities, and guarantees, and uh, this is something that is a, a gap and currently missing for in the EU approach to support news media. Uh, also, in order to engage big tech companies uh, uh, more decisively, uh, we are also putting forward the suggestion of uh, the European Commission to explore the option of uh, introducing a bargaining code that facilitates the, 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 co the compensation negotiation between platforms uh, and news media outlets, and there are already several examples out there in different countries that have uh, introduced uh, such legislation. Of course, it has yielded different results, uh, and so we should learn from their experience when implementing this. Uh, for example, Australia, can Canada, uh, recently California, they have introduced uh, such, such codes, and in order to really uh, address the whole uh, union, it should be uh, uh, a European Union legislation. Um, so we talked about that we need structural changes, uh, a structural approach to address these structural pro the pro pro these problems um, 
and uh, this uh, should address the lack of coordination uh, that is currently existing and the fundamental transformation should be required where all aspects are addressed and all regions uh, and the framework is created in order to address those specific uh, problems in the most vulnerable regions that are more susceptible to uh, where the free media freedom is shrinking the most. Uh, and the final message I think that this panel has is that uh, the shrinking media freedom really creates a vacuum in the information sphere. And uh, it uh, leads to decline of the broader EU European and democratic uh, pillars and values. Uh, it's, it leads to decline of the rule of law, freedom of speech is restricted, which creates a space for malign activity to thrive and to spread more and more. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for your attention, and I will conclude because I overstepped my time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Maria, and. Uh... Thank you to everyone for your attention, but I am particularly thankful to our wonderful panel for handling this uh, restricted schedule and format so brilliantly. Uh, thank you. I think they deserve a round of applause. Um,